Chapter 25 After four days of patrolling and LZ watching with no contact, the militia received a call on the radio from their NHDF contact. Essentially, the request was for men to fight to ISAF's forces in southern New Hampshire. Manchester and parts of Nashua were being turned into battlefields. In fact, one area of Manchester on the Merrimack River was being called Little Stalingrad by the German as if troops fighting there. The defenders were determined to hold true to their state motto, live free or die. One wag on the front line quipped, live free or kill Germans forever. Ironic since his grandparents had left Germany over a hundred years previously. The ISAF controlled the main roads, but barely. Hit and run attacks were the order of the day in the pacified areas. From kids on mountain bikes sniping sentries and escaping on bike trails to old ladies drilling guards at checkpoints with quick shots from their old pocket pistols. The Germans were experiencing what the Russians did when they invaded a country where everyone was armed. <clears throat> Except, of course, that the Americans could shoot a damn sight better than most Afghans. As the invasion stalled, the ISAF poured men and equipment into the fray. At the same time, resistance spread. In Massachusetts, independent militias attacked transportation centers and bridges. Fuel trucks were set afire by rifle fire, a few to poke some holes and a tracer or two to set them off. Train tracks were disrupted, causing either delays in vehicular delivery or in the case of track vehicles forcing them to drive themselves which increased maintenance and track wear. They also found that rubber tires on wheeled vehicles burned really well, <clears throat> especially those on the BTR 60 and 70. The ISAF and what the real Americans call a Muppet government, definitely puppets, and Billery was definitely a hideous character of someone, stopped sending American troops after the first week when three battalions of U.S. mechanized infantry decided to finally fulfill their oaths by changing sides, and a transportation battalion drove straight into NHDF lines with truckloads of ammunition. The commander was leaving the ISAF and decided to just order his men <coughs> to what they were told and drove through the ISAF lines. A large portion of those troops decided to defect, too, once they got to free America. Several squadrons of Air Force fighters had landed in New Hampshire, their pilots loading up with munitions just before leaving for freedom. These aircraft prevented the ISAF from exploiting their aerial capabilities. Using small radio-controlled aircraft and laser designators made in-state by a defense contractor, the NHDF could paint targets in the immediate rear of the ISAF lines that the NHAF pilots could hit them <clears throat> with precision-guided musicians, the seekers of which were made and assembled in Maine launched from Sandoff distances. A priority target were the enemy artillery positions which could safely shell New Hampshire from the protection of Massachusetts. The American artillery units were referred to disparagingly as Jane Fonda brigades. The Free Americans sometimes used cast concrete laser guided bombs proven effective during the Sec Iraq, Second Iraq War to destroy targets. 750 pounds of concrete hitting a bridge at 70 miles per hour makes a mess of things. <clears throat> Meeting at the patrol base, Jim broke the news to the teams. They were looking for volunteers to go to Manch Vegas and fight. They will be facing the enemy in built-up areas, a kind of combat that is labor-intensive and likely to produce many casualties. Most of the militia volunteered. The way many calculated, Having the enemy in one spot gave them a chance to kill them faster. Jim made a quick decision and the team radioed for pickup. They broke camp and prepared to move to the pickup point while Jim and Dave strategized. We need to leave enough people behind to fight an effective delaying action, but send enough people to make an effective unit, like platoon strength or larger. Dave considered this, panting under the weight of his pack. How about we just let some units stay intact? Then we can go as a unit and either take a few other teams with us and fill the spots of folks who stay behind with some folks we trust. Jim nodded. Uh-huh, that's what I was thinking. We'll need to bring a few support people too, logistics team to take care of us, like a micro company trains. Well, we could bring the deuce and two pickups or more 
and a driver logistics person for each vehicle, that would give us a support team in place. Who do we want to stay behind and who do we want on support? We'll have to confer later, see who wants to go and who wants to stay, and work from there. Sounds good. We got a whole day to decide. Yeah, about that. I want everyone to take 24 hours when we get back to rest and relax. That means me and you too. We're going to split into three teams. I want you to take over one. Will will take one. I'll have the other. That way we can have three maneuver elements in town. Sounds good to me. Two days later, the Pine Tree Irregulars were traveling in a convoy bound for their assembly area. The deuce and a half, three pickups, and one Suburban carried the unit. One pickup sported a camper, which was sporting several antenna. The camper had been configured as a commo center and had a small generator and several base station and mobile ham radios inside. With its propane-fired water heater, it could provide a shower and hot meals for the militia if things worked out that they could take advantage of it. Doc was going to use one of the pickups that was fitted with a bed cap as a field ambulance once the gear in the back had been unpacked. He had a driver and two EMT trained assistants to carry litters and help with the grim work that undoubtedly lay ahead. They were detained and then passed through two separate NHDF checkpoints. One manned by a militia from Maine which had come down to fight. The men were tired having been pulled from a line from the line a few days prior and were working the checkpoint as a way of relaxing from the grueling combat they had been engaged in for five straight days. Dave, Jim, and Doc chatted with them for a bit to get a better picture of the situation. Arriving at their designated RV point, they parked and went about e eating a late lunch. Shortly after, a Humvee pulled up and three NHDF troops in olive drab uniforms got out and approached them. Are you the Pine Tree Militia? asked the oldie looking of the three, a gray-haired man in his late fifties. We are, answered Jim. What can I do for you? I'm Dan Whedon. I'm your new contact. I'm afraid there's been some reorganization going on and the younger troops have been given more vigorous assignments. <clears throat> Jim nodded. Indeed, the other two NHDF people looked a bit over 50 themselves. After a silence that started to get awkward, Dan spoke again. After your people have eaten, we'll take you to the training area. It's north of here, a little further from the lines. You'll have time to train. We have two special forces teams here to do that. One is from the Rhode Island National Guard, and the other is from 5th Group at Fort Campbell. How do you know you can trust them, asked Jim. Well, both teams have men with family here in state, and we checked them out through friends, teachers, and such. All came back okay. We don't have a way to do thorough background checks, but we have it on good authority. He winked slowly and dramatically. That JSOC about crapped when the teams defected. Could be part of a deception, but since the team from Rhode Island has family now in camps, I don't believe so. Jim nodded. We'll take our chances, but we're ready to deploy now. My men, a feminine, ahem, broke his train of thought. My men and women are ready to go into the line at any time. I appreciate that you are all experienced in combat, but what we are doing here is training you for urban warfare. My team is trained for urban warfare. Major Whedon paused. How about we let the special forces decide? Sure, grinned Jim back at him. Steve held up his hand and ticked off three fingers. Three, two, one. Bang, bang, bang. The 12 gauge in Mike's hands barked as he shot the lock and deadbolt with a cut down riot gun. As soon as the third shot went off, a combat boot clad foot kicked it in and a man in OD fatigues whipped in the doorway, his M249 saw barking its fast staccato. Immediately behind him, another figure slipped into the room and added sounds of rapid semi-auto fire to the den. Before the third man could slip in, the firing stopped. Clear, clear, all clear that the three persons in the room had entered and hit all the targets in second. Without worrying about hostage targets, this went a lot faster than the room clearing they had practiced under Jim's tutelage so long before. As the rest of the team knew, moved past the doorway, Mike marked the doorway with a bright green spray-painted X to indicate it had been cleared, 
while the other two cleared the room more closely, looking for holes in the walls or ceilings that the enemy could use to slip in behind them. As the last man moved past, the three-man team fell in at the rear of the snake, covering the hallway to the rear. Your men move well. They have done this before? Asked the Special Forces Master Sergeant. Yeah, answered Jim lightly. A time or two. The sergeant nodded. Or two is more like it. I think they're ready. No reason to waste time and ammo on stuff they already know. We'll be passing out frags and these workshop stun grenades we've got before you go. Resupply is tough at the front, so take as much as you can before the supply sergeant catches on. <clears throat> I think we're all set there, too. The sergeant looked at Jim. Oh, did you bring your own? Jim smiled, more to himself than for anyone else's benefits. We have our ways. They did what? Looks like they took twice what they were to be issued. Left a note, too, saying they only took what they would have used in training and a little extra. The master sergeant laughed. We have our ways, the SOB told me. Damned if he didn't. The sergeant smiled. They must have a master scrounger with them. You got how much? I took what we had used in training and about twice what they were going to issue us, which is all from the training stocks, and only about half of what we really needed anyway, Dave answered. I dub you Slicky Boy, said Jim, only half joking. Oh, and I found out about a bunch of captured stuff too from their armor. Turns out he's a guy I know from a website I used to hang out at before this started. He lives around here and got shot in the leg while he and some friends were successfully relisting the unreasonable search and seizure section of the Constitution. Another week and they'll let him back on the line, but for now he's helping out the SF dudes. Where is it at? In the back of his truck. He's going to bring it by when we get set up. Jim shook his head. You are something else, you know that? Dave grinned. As long as it's a good something else, we're cool. You know it, homie. The unexpected windfall of captured gear included three RPG-7V rocket launchers and five boxes of four rockets each. Also, 30 blocks of TNT, 55 electric blasting caps, four Russian Claymore copies, two rolls of double-strand electrical wire, and six cases of old Russian F-1 grenades with fuses. The Rushki frags have fuses marked with a zero and no one wants them. But with an instant fuse, they'll make great booby traps, or you can use electric caps or whatever. Thanks, man. I can't tell you how much I appreciate this, said Dave. I told you, don't worry. Besides, my militia unit has lots more, and he winked. Dave smiled. Well, all right then. I'll see you on the line. His friend shook his hand. Be right there next to you in a couple of days. Take it easy, Dave. They parked the trucks in an old strip mall that was now a field hospital. They would set up here and from here would deploy as the NHDF needed them. They could hear rifle and mortar fire in the distance. The teams divided up and started getting ready, preparing LBEs and packs. The plan was to drive as close as they could, then march to join the units already on the line. They were being integrated into the 2nd Battalion Londonderry Rifles, an NHDF unit the irregular that included one regular army company that had defected, a National Guard armor company that had no armor and was fighting as infantry, and two companies of citizen soldiers, veterans and patriots fighting with their own weapons and equipment. With 28 men entering the line, they were either the smallest company or the largest platoon in the battalion. Attrition was eating away at the number of available fighters. <clears throat> They had brought two garden carts with them, large wooden affairs with bicycle tires, <clears throat> used in more mundane times to move mulch and leaves around the yard with ease. They were just right for hauling ammo forward and casualties to the rear. For now, they were loaded with ammo, food, and water. Will came up to Jim as he was buckling a chest pouch over his body armor. Those frags, the Russian pineapples. <clears throat> yeah, what about them, Jim replied. I remember reading about those fuse marked with a zero, and they're just a manufacturer's mark, I seem to recall. That contact today said they were instant fuses. Well, I asked Dave, and he said no one would use them because they heard they were instant. Well, you can throw the first one if you want. We'll either give you a good funeral or buy you a drink. 
Better not be water, jo joked Will. I'll find a way to try them safely when we hit the trenches. Just don't kill yourself. I won't. Sam would never forgive me. They passed into the forward lines after dark, moving up with guides in groups of threes and fours. Eventually, they were all in place, occupying a largish apartment building that had overlooked the Merrimack River and four houses on the same street. Voice-powered phones linked all five buildings, and Jim immediately set about checking the lines, repositioning people here and there, walking through with each leader, making sure they knew their fields of fire and where the friendlies were. What they, what they had would have to do until daylight, and wait for dark again to make any changes. The RPG teams were set up outside. They couldn't really fire safely from inside the buildings. Jim had set up rear security and put out some of the Russian F-1 grenades as booby traps. Instant fuses or not, they'll do the job. Their job was to hold this section of the line, report any movement. There was river access across from them where the enemy could conceivably launch their amphibious BTRs and BMPs against them. The river was fairly low and they might even be able to get trucks across at that point. After one or two days, they'd rotate forward to fight, and we would be relieved by a unit from the line. Two days on, one off was the rotation right now. Fight, rest, rearm, return to the fray. They took some fire the first night. Nothing personal, just harassing small arms fire from across the way. After a large caliber machine gun bullet passed all the way through one of the houses Dave's team occupied, he had no trouble getting them to fill and stack sandbags inside against the riverside wall. The sun rose, bathing the far side of the river in the bright red light of dawn. Will and Dave immediately noticed the sunlight reflecting from several houses of the broken out windows in the building across and downriver from them. OPs aren't too smart over there, noted Will. I see at least two guys with binos. Well, the rules of engagement are simple. Let's get Jim on the horn and see if they have a shot from the apartment. Dave picked up the TA-1 phone and pushed the ringer on the side. This is Dave. We've got people in at least two rooms in the warehouse looking right at us with optics. Okay, third floor from the right, sixth window. Top floor from the right, tenth window. Yeah, if you can. Might as well be proactive. I'll tell them. Dave replaced the phone. Will, tell your people we are under observation and that we're going to be engaging the as-if guys with sniper fire. Tell them to stay under cover and don't shoot unless it's an all-out attack or we tell them it's all right. Sure, Dave. I'll spread the word to all the houses. We don't know what they'll do, so we may get shot at in return. No problem. Will's voice was cut off by a single shot from the apartment. They both grabbed their own binos and looked at the warehouse. They saw movement in the room on the top floor, shadows rushing back and forth. Must have hit them, remarked Will as the TA-1 jingled. <clears throat> Dave, right, we'll see what we can do. Hang up the phone, Dave turned to Will. Jim wants to see if we can get a 40 millimeter or two through the window. Will smiled. Let's see, I'll be right back. Will left the room and Dave could hear him giving instructions in the hallway. Several minutes later, he heard, the, he heard the hollow thunk of at least two 40mm grenade launchers firing. They had three with them, and the window erupted in a ball of black smoke as two high-explosive grenades detonated nearly simultaneously across the river, a shot of about 250 yards. Gunfire sprouted on the, on the occupied side as German gunners lashed out in retribution. Red tracers skipped across the river and ricocheted over their heads, as at least two hidden machine guns swept the opposite bank. A roar and a whoosh indicated a militia RPG team had spotted them. Dave watched the RPG-7 rocket leap across the Merrimack and strike a pile of rubble in a blinding flash. A half second later, the sound of the strike rolled across the river. Another long burst of machine gun fire came from the position and defiance of the rocket attack. After a few more minutes, the machine gun fire tapered off, as did the return fire from the free side of the river. <clears throat> the order went out. Feel free to shoot anybody on the other side of the river at will. 
keep the enemy off balance. The militia took to the order like ducks to water and kept up fire all day. As the sun set, the militia countered no casualties on their part and several confirmed kills across the way. Dave was crossing from his right flank positions back to the main command post, or CP, in the early morning twilight. He had just checked the lines again, making sure everyone on duty was awake and alert, bringing what little coffee they had to a few of the troops. As he crouched over to run from behind a storage shed to the cover of a small ranch house, he heard a roar in the air that sounded like a freight train. Income! He started to yell, but he was cut off as exploding artillery shells started to burst around the militia's lines. The first blast was a hundred yards away and back behind their forward positions, but it was still enough to make Dave get down. He curled into a ball as more explosions tore through the early morning, in and around their positions. As he hugged the ground, another explosion, this one much closer, picked him up and slammed him into the ground. A wood splinter and painted shingles fell around him as the small ranch house disintegrated from a direct hit. More explosions, some from smaller weapons, light mortars through 155 millimeter cannons worked a two mile stretch of the New Hampshire line. The barrage lasted for about 20 minutes, which to those on the receiving end felt like an eternity. As the last echoes of explosions drifted away, Small arms fire erupted from the far bank. Dave quickly leapt to his feet and looked around. The house in front of him was splintered and the remains were burning. He could sm hear small arms ammunition cooking off in the fire and could what he assumed was smell burning flesh. He faintly heard the cries of wounded men, but he quickly put those sounds aside. With machine gun, trainers criss with machine gun tracers crisscrossing the sky over his head, he had to get ready for what was next. <clears throat> he took off at a run to the right flank positions, diving more or less head first into the nearest fighting positions. He was caught and set upright by its occupants. The two militiamen had stunned looks on their faces. Everyone all right? asked Dave, giving them in the once over for obvious injuries. Yeah, mumbled the older of the two. The house is gone, man. <coughs> I know, I know, replied Dave. <clears throat> we got to find Steve. Steve was in there. And the man put down his SAR-1 AK clone as if to climb out of the hole. Dave put a hand on his arm. Chuck, we can't right now. He's either okay or not, and we can't change that. Hear the machine guns? We need to get ready. I think the as-ifs are coming over to play. <clears throat> Nodding his understanding, Chuck picked up his rifle. Chuck, Mike, I need you guys to stay here. Shoot anyone bad. If they get close to crossing the river, get out of the hole with weapons and ammo only and fight a delaying action for as long as you can hold out, all right? Both men said yes simultaneously. I have to go check out the rest of the squad. And Dave climbed out of the hole even as Chuck and Steve started shooting sparingly, waiting for targets. Dave was running across what was once a well-tended lawn when dirt kicked up around his feet. He fell as if hit, but it immediately rolled to his right, tucking in behind a large oak tree, whose top was torn and tattered from a mortar bursting in its high branches. Several more shirt bursts thudded into the thick trunk before the gunner's attention was caught by something else to shoot at. <clears throat> Even as he ran forward, Dave's ears picked up the telltale sound of tank engines and the squeaking of tracks from the far side of the river. He ran even harder, if possible, for the security of the last house on the right. Reaching the corner, he saw that there was already a medical team working on a wounded militiaman. He waved to Tony, who came over right away. Stu was hit by shrapnel on the legs and chest. Doc's working on him. Says he should survive. How about everyone else, Dave asked, panting like a dog after his strenuous run. We're okay. <clears throat> Good, said Dave, cutting him off. Get all the anti-tank stuff we've got ready. I hear tanks. Is that what that was? Move, Dave urged Tony. Joining Tony, Dave helped place the team using trees and terrain for cover, handing out the last little tidbits of advice. He heard a shout and turned to see Sonya 
one of his late additions pointing across the river. Dave turned in time to see an M1 Abrams tank poke its snout from behind the large brick building. The turret scanned left and right and the monster lurched forward, its track squeaking making more noise than the relative quiet of its turbine engine. As the Abrams cleared the building, it angled towards a low spot in the opposite river bank, a good place for a tank to attempt to ford the river. A second 120mm smoothbore gun sprouted from the corner, followed shortly by a second Abrams, which also pivoted its turret. But this time the gun turned to the tank's left, towards the occupied mill. So startling was its cannon firing that Dave blinked in surprise. A large hole was blasted into the wall of the mill. Suddenly the enemy line opened up and Dave could see tracer bullets ricocheting wildly up in the air as small caliber bullets bounced off the Abrams' Chabam armor. Behind the second M1 came a Bradley infantry fighting vehicle, its turret pointing to the rear, spinning rounds from its 25mm cannon. From behind the building came an explosion and a column of frame and smoke that rose over the roof. The first tank clambered down the embankment and Dave could clearly see the turret was marked with a black Maltese cross. Its main gun flashed smoke and flame as it fired into the militia lines. The second Abrams worked its way down the riverbank, turning its turret. When the muzzle of the main gun was, was properly aligned and two spoke, this time firing an armor-piercing, fin-stabilizing, discarding Cebu, or APF-SDS round, into the rear of the first Abrams hull. Traveling at a speed of over one mile per second, the depleted uranium round tore through the engine compartment. Another round followed, throwing up a shower of sparks as it violated the armored sanctuary of the turret. The tank immediately ground to a halt as black flames poured from the engine bay. After a brief moment, the hatches on the turret blew open, even as the blast doors on the back of the turret spouted red fire and black smoke as its ammunition burned. An as-if RPG gunner leaned out of an upper story window trying to get a shot at the turncoat, turret's, turncoat tank's turret top. Dave quickly threw his car 15 to his shoulder and started shooting. He wasn't the only one, and the gunner tumbled out of the window in a cloud of red brick dust thrown up by rounds from a dozen weapons. <clears throat> the Bradley entered the river with a spray of white foam and the coaxial machine gun working the upper windows of the factory. Dave could hear the staccato roar of individual weapons firing from his side of the river as the shell-shocked militia forces regained their equilibrium and picked up the fire. <clears throat> Yet another Bradley appeared, it too firing over its own rear deck at unseen forces. From the far side of the factory, a T-90 appeared, one of the many tanks acquired by, the, by Germany when the Berlin Wall came down. The Abrams fired again, and the T-90's turret flew off in a blast that sent a shockwave across the river. Small black objects started appearing from the brick buildings and windows as the invaders dropped grenades, trying desperately to kill the armored monster in their midst. They exploded in impressive black clouds that did little more than scratch the paint of the tank. The first Bradley waddled up ashore near to Dave and quickly pivoted in place, its tracks tearing up the black earth as they turned in opposite directions. As soon as the rear of the Bradley was out of the ISAF fires, the rear ramp dropped and nearly a dozen U.S. troops poured out of the back, quickly taking up positions facing across the river. They added their firepower to the militias in short order. The second Bradley fired at smoke canisters and disappeared behind a wall of white smoke, which it quickly bloke through as it too headed for the ford. Even as the Bradley came forward, the front wall of the building erupted in a large explosion. The familiar shape of an A-10 roared overhead, and several more large explosions came from the far side of the river as it passed. From Dave's far right, an RPG roared across the river and disappeared behind the factory. Another ball of fire billowed upwards as the shape charge rocket found its mark. German troops clad in fleck camo started charging from the factory, shooting desperately across the river. Rifles, machine guns, and 25mm cannon fire made short work of them. 
Flame and black smoke was hurled from the windows of the factory as the A-10 made another pass, this time on the right side. Debris rained down on the remaining M-1, which quickly lurched forward and turned towards the river. Up and down the river, similar events were unfolding. American units were turning on both ISAF forces and the turncoat Americans in their midst. Dave's heart leapt. Pausing to reload his car 15, he heard the sounds of firing up and down the riverbanks. The whole line must be doing this, he thought, as he slapped the bolt catch with the heel of his left hand. Using the burning, shattered house as cover, he raced to his left to where the second Bradley was disgorging its cargo. Dave noted that each dismounting man carried two or three AT-4 rockets in their left hand and deposited them on the ground well to the rear of the track behemoth. A pair of men broke away from the others, one man carrying a radio on his back, the other looking at Dave and moving towards him. <clears throat> Captain Goins, Alpha 315th Infantry, at your service, he announced himself to Dave. Hi, I'm Dave, the XO here, replied Dave, taking a knee. Well, we're glad to see you're on our side. Well, most of us are, actually, said the captain. He and his radio men both took a knee with Dave. We had to take care of a few on our way over. Is this Jim's sector? Yeah, why? I'm supposed to meet up with him and take his unit across to counterattack. And we're supposed to trust you? The captain smiled. Let's just see Jim. Okay, follow me, said Dave, as he propelled himself to his feet. Whirling, he took off towards the militia CP. He saw Jim on his own radio and stopped in front of him. Jim smiled. Is that Captain Goins? He asked with a wink. Dave grinned. You scroungy turd. You arranged this and didn't tell me? Opsec, Jim said. Dave nodded. He could accept that. Captain, I'm Jim. Are your men ready to take us across? Yes, we are, answered the captain. <clears throat> a series of explosions and a flurry of small arms fire sounded from upstream. But if we don't hurry, we're going to miss the fun. Dave, said Jim, get your half the line ready. Weapons and ammo only. If you see Doc, tell him to follow us when he can. He's down my way, I'll tell him. <clears throat> The captain spoke in the radio handspit and then spoke to Jim and Dave. I've got three M113s ready to cross. Send them over, answered Jim. Send one to the left and right and one in between the Bradleys. Did you bring the AT4s? Yeah, they're behind that Brad, Gowen said, pointing to the closest one. Dave, have the men grab those and distribute them to the M113s. Right, said Dave. He was up and off, rallying the militia. <clears throat> The rest of the day was a blur to Dave. The hurried river crossing and the box-like M113s shooting over the top of the open rear hatch. <clears throat> Pausing to reload magazines from stripper clips in the back of the M113. The hurried assault on the artillery battery, the guns attached to the back of the German trucks, the body slumped over the trail legs of the cannon, laying where they fought a desperate holding action trying to buy time for a hasty retreat. And finally, as the noon hour passed, more and more American units joining the fray. And finally, the ISAF units surrendering en masse, the momentum of the American advance catching them completely unaware. By the end of the day, they had completely destroyed the forces assembled to literally invade New Hampshire. By the end of the week, they had liberated almost all of New England and were fighting desperate units bypassed and trapped in Hartford and can see the towering buildings of New York City from the Connecticut shore. The victory of the New England forces weakened the resolve of the ISAF forces all over the country and encouraged action by other Americans. All over the country resistance cells sprouted and occupation forces from a myriad of countries suffered their wrath. The units from New England region slowly approached Washington DC but did not move into the area itself. Laying siege to large cities was preferable to battling it out house to house against a lost cause. <clears throat> the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff got the football that contained the codes for all America's nuclear weapons and managed to convince the Air Force Chief to place all nukes on a standby status where they would only fire upon confirmation of weapons launch from hostile powers. No nuclear weapons would be used on American soil against Americans. The ISAF countries were at their wits end. Their already shattered economies 
already weakened by the global crisis and their socialist nanny policies, would not support the military buildup that would be required to deploy a force large enough to have any effect on the situation in America. One by one, they reached agreements with the professional government in Concord, New Hampshire, and gradually ceasefires were arranged throughout much of the country. After being disarmed, the foreign troops were treated firmly but fairly and were eventually returned to their homelands. The cost of housing, transportation, and guarding the troops was billed to their respective governments and were used as leverage for the forgiveness of original defaults that had been the excuse for their invasion in the first place. Most of the traitorous Congress was imprisoned or shot. The, vice, the president and her vice president were found in the Oval Office, victims of an apparent murder-suicide. There was little mourning when that was announced. We all know the rest, how a true constitutional republic was reborn, how the Constitution was written, rewritten in layman's language and the courts were changed to prevent lifelong tenure. Congress, too, had limits on how many consecutive terms a person could serve. The rule of law was restored, and the rule of legalese was, hopefully, cast aside forever. The legal system again became a justice system, and social welfare again became the domain of private organizations where it should have always been. And how the sacrifices of brave patriots, men and women, who freed this great nation from the tyranny of global socialism, inspired others in faraway places to establish free republics of their own. Poland, first, with the help of many Americans of Polish descent, South Africa, where a long, bitter, and bloody war finally restored freedom and true equality, Kenya, and eventually England, all became free at last. And that is the story of my grandfather, David McGrath, Governor of New Hampshire, Senator to the Republic's Congress in Kansas, and in my own eyes, the greatest hero of the war. I have assembled this narrative from the letters he wrote to my grandmother, the stories of my dad and uncle, his sons, who have told me, and interviews with my grandfather, who lives out the remainder of his days in peace at his mountain cabin, just the way he wanted to in the first place.